Jim Jones was one of the most infamous cult leaders of the 20th century. Has any of you guys heard about this guy? No? Okay. Well, I'll tell you a little bit about who he is. He was born on May 13th, 1931, which was quite a long time ago. It was said that he grew up as a regular churchgoer, and after graduating from university, he decided to enter into ministry. He ministered out of Indianapolis, Indiana, where he gained a reputation as a charismatic leader who claimed to have prophetic powers, such as the ability to predict the future and to even heal people of their sicknesses. In 1955, he established a Pentecostal church that eventually came to be known as the People's Temple. As you can see, it is already heading in a pretty bad direction, right? When we examine his beliefs, we see that something was very off. Jones did not believe that Jesus was the Son of God, but that he was at best an agent sent by God to teach about the message of socialism. As the years went on, Jones strayed further away from Orthodox Christian beliefs, going so far as to call himself a prophet who became obsessed with power and influence over people's lives. He no longer believed in the God of the Bible, but instead declared himself to be God or some sort of God. And that's not good news. So Jones took hundreds of his cult followers to the country of Guyana, where, so that's a country that's in the Caribbean, it's like a small island, where he established a community called Jonestown where he hoped to establish a socialist society using his followers as guinea pigs. Jones confiscated passports along with millions of dollars from his followers and even threatened those who questioned his authority or expressed a desire to leave his religion. And it eventually ended with some people escaping and thinking that this would get the U.S. authorities involved in the situation. Jones decided he was just going to end it all. So he activated a long rehearsed suicide plan that he was going to use in the event that everything went wrong. So on November 18, 1978, in one of the most tragic incidences ever recorded, Jones had over 900 of his followers drink a poisoned punch and many of them did it passively and obeyed. They all ended up dying, and Jones killed himself by a self-inflicted gun wound shot. See, this is one of the worst case scenarios of what happens when you join a quote-unquote Christian cult. In fact, many throughout history have claimed to be Christian and have claimed to minister in the name of Jesus, but yet they end up misleading many people and doing them harm both physically and spiritually. So we see this happening even in the days of Jesus where Judaism had warped into something that was very different from what Moses taught back in his days. That this was a religion filled with so many rules and rituals that are not even in the Bible, using that to replace faith essentially. So these Jewish leaders have in many senses have become cult leaders and have duped many of their followers into eternal condemnation. So Jesus tells us that there will be false religious leaders claiming to worship God, but they really are not. So he tells us what they are like so that we can avoid their example. And that's pretty much what we're going to see in today's passage in Luke chapter 20, verse 41. And we're going to go to verse 4 in the next chapter. So just to give you a little context, if you guys remember, Jesus is still having these scuffles with the religious leaders. So last week, he got a question from the Sadducees about the resurrection. They were making fun of the resurrection using this really silly example of the woman who married these seven guys, these seven brothers. And he was pretty much telling them that there is a resurrection. They don't know their scripture. So this week, Jesus is now going to himself ask a question to the scribes, to the experts in the law about messianic prophecy. So the reason why he does this is to expose both their lack of understanding as well as their corrupt 
spiritual character. Their depravity, which is a warning against religious hypocrisy. And that's the main theme of today's passage. So today, this passage warns us about the danger of false religion through these two characteristic traits of its leaders. Yeah, this is controversial stuff we're looking at. So let's look at point number one. So first, Jesus exposes the ignorance of false religious leaders. One of the things that you're going to notice about false religious leaders, whether they claim to be Christian or some other God worshiper, is that they really are ignorant of Scripture. So let's look at that in verse 41 to 44. So in verse 41, it says, Then Jesus said to them, the scribes, How is it that they say, The Christ is David's son? For David himself says in the book of Psalms, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. Okay, let's stop right there for a second. So Jesus is now going to get them to think about this question of who is Jesus. Because they don't believe Jesus is the Son of God. They, they think Jesus is just a man and a bad, bad teacher because he's teaching people to believe in him and they don't really believe that he's the Son of God. So that's why he was asking this question from the Old Testament. So according to the Old Testament, you, we remember, right, that the Messiah is supposed to be a descendant of who? David, right? He's supposed to be a descendant of King David. That was part of the covenant that he made with David, that your, one of your descendants is going to be the righteous ruler, the Messiah, who's going to rule Israel pretty much into eternity. Oh, yeah. So he's saying right here, from the book of Psalm itself, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. This is a very strange verse. The Lord said to my Lord. The Lord said to my Lord. I think we're seeing kind of a Trinity reference going on right here. Oh yeah, see this was even predicted back in the Old Testament. Now he was saying, how could David call his son, Lord. Because I don't know about, you know, you guys, but back then, it's not customary for fathers to call their sons Lord. So we see something really interesting going on right here. It should be the other way around. But then he even says that the Messiah is at the right hand of God. Now, whenever that expression is used, that's basically saying that this Messiah, this figure, has the same authority and power as God himself. So basically, what the psalm passage is saying is that the Messiah is going to be both God and man at the same time. You don't believe me? Let's look at Psalm 45, verse 6. Here's just one example in the Old Testament. Your throne, O God, is forever and ever. A scepter of uprightness is the scepter of your Kingdom. Mm -hmm. Yes, we see that the future king, the son of David, is going to be the Lord himself. So now, in verse 44, this is where he's trying to get at. Therefore, David calls him Lord, and how is he his son? Nobody has an answer. You see, this is why I love Jesus so much, because he can always ask these questions to get people to think why their worldview is false. So basically what Jesus is trying to get at from the Old Testament is that the Messiah is going to be both fully God and fully man at the same time. That David's descendant would be God in human flesh, which is why David gives his son such honor, such reverence, such praise. Wow. Yet even in the face of such good arguments, the religious leaders are still hardened to the truth. They don't believe it. And that is so sad. You see, one of the things that marks false religions, especially cult, is that they deny the deity of Christ. Because if you look at a lot of religions around the world, a lot of them would say Jesus Christ is not the Son of God, or at least not the unique Son of God. 
This is one of the major aspects about the Christian faith that we have to believe in in order to be saved. And if you deny this, it's pretty much to your spiritual detriment. So I'll give you one example regarding the deity of Christ. I don't know how much you guys know about the Mormon religion. It claims to be Christian, like one of the denominations of Christianity, but because they have pretty much forsaken the foundational truths of the gospel, we cannot consider them Christian. We consider them pretty much a cult, a different religion, because they don't believe that Jesus is God in human flesh. They don't believe that Jesus is the Son of God. Rather, I don't know if you know this, but according to the writings, they believe that Jesus <clears throat> is pretty much an elevated, created being that happens to be the older brother of Lucifer. Mm -hmm. According to their writings, they say Jesus is just one of millions of created spirit beings born in heaven who became man and attained godhood like many Mormon followers hope to achieve once they die. And sadly, this comes not just because of ignorance of Scripture, but also a flawed interpretation of Scripture. So the whole lesson behind point number one is this. The Old Testament and Jesus himself affirms that Messiah is pretty much God in human flesh. That we need to believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. If we say that Jesus Christ is only human or only God, then that pretty much destroys our faith. So this is basically what he's trying to get these people to think of. Because a lot of these people claim to worship God. Doesn't matter if they're Jew or a Muslim. You can claim to worship the Lord God all you want, but if you deny Jesus is the Son of God, you deny that He is the only way to the Father, then you're pretty much doomed. You're going to die in your sins, and we cannot fall for this trap. So this is really one of the proofs from the Old Testament that Jesus, the Messiah, would be both God and human at the same time. But that's not all, folks. Because now Jesus is going to expose something else about false religion. That's something very important. So point number two, Jesus exposes the corruption of false religious leaders. So in the rest of the, these verses, we're going to see that false spiritual leaders, hypocrites, are characterized by corruption most of the time. So let's look at verse 45. So now Jesus turns to the disciples and says this, while all the people were listening, he said to the disciples, Beware of the scribes. Mm -hmm. He says, Beware, meaning beware of their doctrine. Beware of their practices. And when Jesus says, Beware, we got to listen. So he's saying that the Pharisees and the Sadducees of their time, they look holy, but they are not role models to be imitated. We should know that by now because Jesus has been saying that so much in Scripture. You see, I read from Isaiah chapter 29, verse 13. I'm going to say this again because Jesus even brought this verse up in the New Testament as well. He said, This people draw near with their words and they honor me with their lips, but they remove their hearts from me because their worship of me consists of traditions. That's exactly what the Pharisee religion is. All these rituals, all these rules and traditions, thinking that that was going to pretty much buy their way into heaven. But Jesus says, I reject all that because your heart is completely empty. You have no faith. And these guys were the example of that. Okay, then what was it about these leaders that Jesus didn't really like? He's going to give us a few examples right here. Well, first of all, these hypocrites... They love to, look at this, they love to walk around in long robes. So they really love their outward appearance. And this was like pretty expensive appearance that's meant to draw attention to their holiness. In Numbers, chap, in, uh, Numbers chapter 15, yes, verses 38 to 40, I don't know if you guys have read that section, but God instructed Israel to add tassels to their robes, which is meant to Remind them of their need to obey the Lord in love. But these people didn't love God. It was all just to show. So it can draw attention. Show them, oh, look how holy I am. 
You know, some religions still do that these days. Did you know that? That's why they have so much focus on the outward appearance, on the apparel. I mean, I'm not saying it's wrong to necessarily wear apparel that looks nice, but if that's used as a substitute for righteousness, then uh, Jesus has something to say about that. So let's look at another thing that Jesus didn't like about these Pharisees. It says right here that they love respectful greetings in the marketplace. They wanted to be noticed by the people. They craved for the attention. They loved it when people called them rabbi or even father, you know, things like that. And they said that if you don't call me rabbi, then something's wrong with you, essentially. It's a big form of shame. They love that attention. And then here's something else. It says they also love the chief seats in the synagogues and places of honors and banquets. So back then, the chief seats or the best seats in the house was right next to the host, who oftentimes was the rich and influential person, whether in politics or in religion. Oh yeah, they didn't want to sit in the worst seat. They want to sit with the best people. Oh man. And then look what else Jesus says about them. Who devour widows' houses. Devour, that means to eat up completely. To take advantage of them. The vulnerable people. They took advantage of them in every single way. From taking their money to taking their homes through manipulation and coercion. And then another thing about these hypocrites is, according to the Bible, for appearance sake, they offer long prayers. Mm, Jesus talked about this in the Sermon on the Mount. These people love to pray openly, loudly, so that people can see them praying. Oh, look at what holy people they are. But they didn't really want to do this because they wanted a relationship with God. It was all for public show. They wanted to exalt themselves so that people can see how holy they are. Now, once again, I want to say this. It is not wrong to pray in public. We do this all the time when we eat meals, of course, when we go to restaurants and this and that. But I would say it is wrong when you only pray in public. There's nothing going on in your personal spiritual life, meaning if you never pray in your own spiritual time, but you just do it in front of other people. And sometimes, you know, do you do it as a way to show off how holy you are? Then I would say your faith is probably dead. Probably have no faith. And this is exactly what happened with them. So what is going to happen with them? It tells us right here. These will receive greater condemnation. How sad. You see, Jesus tells us that the greatest condemnation in hell is not for those people who have committed certain sins like murder or blasphemy or rape or stealing. Mm -mm. He says that the greatest condemnation in hell is going to be reserved for those who knew the word of God but ended up rejecting it, twisting it, and misrepresenting it to other people. So that is why I would be terrified if I grew up learning the gospel and things of the Christian faith. I knew all this, but then I ended up turning my back on Jesus later on in life, never coming back because he says the greatest condemnation is pretty much going to be for you guys. Mm -hmm. I did all this work of dying on the cross for your sins, but then you ended up just spitting on it and rejecting it. That's why he says it's very serious to reject the gospel. Hmm. You see, just to drive it home, he's going to give this example right here with kind of like a different picture of giving. So in verse 1 of the next chapter, it says, He looked up and saw the rich putting their gifts into the treasury, and he saw a poor widow putting in two small copper coins. So... The giving of these, uh, this widow is going to be used to contrast with the giving of people who just wanted attention. So the rich, you know, all these people were putting their money into the treasury, these uh, trumpet-shaped receptacles. I don't have a picture right here, but it's pretty much shaped like this, and it goes into a box. So they would throw all their money in, and it was quite a show because once they threw their money in, it makes this loud clanging sound. 
So imagine if you had a whole bunch of money and you're just like, boom, wow, look how loud it, it was clinging. You see how much I gave? It can be used to call attention as well. But then Jesus says, look at this widow right here. It says she gave two small copper coins. Smallest denomination in the Jewish currency. You know how little this is? It's like if you add it together, it's just one penny in ancient times. That's how poor she was. And in verses three to four, Jesus said, I say to you, this poor widow put in more than all of them. For they all, out of their surplus, put into the offering. But she, out of her poverty, put in all that she had to live on. Well, percentage-wise, yeah, she did give quite a lot. Because think about this, guys. Let's say you make $1,000 a week, which is very reasonable because a lot of people out there do make $1,000 a week. You put in about $100 into the offering, that's about 10%, right? But imagine another person who made $100 a week, a college student, let's say. I mean, that's kind of a small figure. Maybe it doesn't work that much, but $100 a week. But yet, he gives $50 away, and he keeps only 50. Even though we can say that the guy who made more money gave more, but then if you think about it percentage-wise, who really gave more? Because the college student gave 50% of what he had, in contrast to that person who gave 10%. So it's really not about the money. It's really about the heart in the situation. You could be a poor person, but if you're giving away most of what you have, Jesus takes notice of that. And this is exactly why he commends this widow. But then on the flip side, this is kind of a sad situation because he knew that this widow was giving money, all she had to fund an apostate corrupt religious system. And that undoubtedly saddened him so, so much that this religion that she followed robbed her spiritually and financially. So the whole lesson behind point number two is pretty simple. False religious systems is pretty much just an outward show. You know why? You can tell by the motive. Once you start denying the gospel and the deity of Christ, and you start teaching another gospel, you're going to see the fruits coming out. Bad fruit, greed, corruption, lust, deceitfulness, manipulation. It's not the fruits of the Spirit. So that is why he is using the example of these scribes and the Pharisees to show us this is how you know who they are. It's not just because they have bad teaching, bad understanding of Scripture, but you see, they don't have faith because look at the way their life, look at the, what's happening in their life. So I really want to get you guys to think about this because this is so important because Jesus, once again, he exposes the ignorance as well as the corruption of false religious systems to show us what spiritual hypocrites look like and to warn us so that we do not follow their example. So I want to challenge you guys with this in closing. I think most of you guys have grown up in environments where people have taught you the word of God for the most part and be very thankful for that. But just remember that these tendencies can still creep up and it could cause us to fall. So be careful not to follow in on the ways of the scribes and the Pharisees where your faith is only just an outward show, but inwardly you're pretty much dead. But he's saying, if you're still alive and you hear this, you still have time. Because just like the Pharisees and the scribes had time, even back then to repent, you guys still as well. So I pray that if this is something that still has not hit home with you, then pray to God and say, Lord, I don't know if I'm a spiritual hypocrite, but I do sense that something maybe is wrong. I see some of these things that I see in the Pharisees and scribes, and I want to get right with you right now. 
Yes, come before God. Pray before Him. Follow Christ. Trust in what He did for you on the cross. And you know what? You will be saved. And He's going to work something in you that's a miracle so that you are not the same person anymore, but that you are completely different, unlike the scribes and the Pharisees where everything you do is not for a show, but you're doing it because you want to honor the Lord. And that's the main difference between a true believer and those who don't believe. So this is what I want to encourage with you today. Let's pray. Lord, we know that this world is populated by people who follow in on religions that are leading them into damnation. Even those who claim to follow Christ, but yet their doctrine and their way of life does not exemplify that they are truly in the faith. So I pray, Lord, that you will help us to safeguard our hearts from these tendencies. So not necessarily so that we won't become victims, but that we won't be a bad example to others who want to know what is true Christianity. They want to see what true faith is. They want to know what does love for God look like. So we pray, Lord, that you will strengthen us. Help us, Lord, in times of temptation. And give us discernment so that we don't fall for the trap of Satan. But that we may be guided by the words of God that will lead to eternal life. And we thank you, Lord, that you have gotten us this far in the faith. And we pray, continue to safeguard us until we hit the finish line. And let us also go to others who have been trapped and deceived by spiritual hypocrites and false religions so that they too may turn to the Savior and be saved. Through our evangelism, we pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen.